Welcome to Stuff They Didn't Teach Me in Sunday School. Last week we left Jesus in the tomb. You know he didn't stay there. I know he didn't stay there. John sure knows he didn't stay there. John will show you no, than, no less than four appearances of the risen Christ to people. You're familiar with most of them, probably all of them. The first one is his appearance to Mary Magdalene, and that's a very famous section in scripture. Then he appears to the disciples in the upper room, the disciples minus Thomas, and then the next appearance is the next week to Thomas, to show Thomas his wounds and so that Thomas believes. Interesting, in that story, Thomas says, unless I touch his hands and put my fingers in his side, I'm not gonna believe. And the next week, Jesus shows up to Thomas to say, here, here, go ahead and touch, go ahead and feel. And we're never told that Thomas does that. He falls to his knees and says, my Lord and my God. The appearance I wanna spend the most time with in the stuff they didn't teach me in Sunday school is in chapter 21. It's sort of the epilogue to the book of John. It's an appearance that Jesus makes to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. I wanna do this in a little bit of detail. We're told in chapter 21, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, also called the Sea of Galilee. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan, Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Interesting comment. I used to tell my secretaries uh, when I was school principal on a warm day in the summer, uh, John 21, three. They knew that meant I was going fishing. Peter's fishing was more than just a hobby. It was his, his way of life, his living. And here they have followed Jesus. They have watched him suffer. They've watched him die. They know he's risen because they've seen him on two occasions now. And Peter says, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to the way things used to be. The other disciples said, we will go with you. My secretaries used to quote that line to me too. We'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. The disciples see him. You probably know this story. First of all, Jesus tells them, go cast your nets out on the other side. You haven't caught anything. Try it on the other side of the boat. Most of us that fish know that's sort of a ridiculous suggestion throw it out on the other side of the boat. They do, and they bring in this raft of fishes, and then, and then Peter jumps into the water. We're told he puts his clothes on and gets into the water. We might think that'd be the other way around, but he was stripped down for work, and he throws clothes on, jumps in the water, because he can swim back to shore faster than that boat's gonna get there. When everybody gets to the shore, Jesus has breakfast prepared for him there. He's uh, fried up some fish. Somebody counted those fish. Somebody counted those fish. If you go to verse 11, so Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. When I get to heaven, it's not a big deal, but when I get to heaven, I'm gonna ask who counted those fish? Who is sitting there with their savior, risen savior right in front of them and goes back to the boat and counts the fish? I don't know. Uh, I don't even know why they're counted. One suggestion, and St. Jerome um, in about the fourth century AD made this suggestion that, that those fish represent all the people groups in the world, 153 people groups in the world that, that Christ would bring into his net of the church. Eh, that might be a bit of a stretch, but I, I do wonder why those fish were counted at that time. It's the latter part of this chapter that I find intriguing. When they'd finished breakfast in verse 15, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, and notice he doesn't call him Peter. He doesn't call him the rock. Peter hadn't been much of a rock during this passion story. And Jesus uses his old name because Peter's gone back to his old life too. And he says, do you love me more than these? Now many Bible scholars think that when he says these, he's talking about the other disciples because after all, Jesus, Peter did stand up uh, when uh, when Jesus had foretold that they'd all forsake him on Monday, Thursday evening, Peter said, no, the rest of these may run out on you, but I won't, you can count on me. And Jesus may be taunting him a little bit and saying, do you love me more than these? I, I'm gonna suggest that what he's pointing at is those fish. 
And then he's saying, do you love me more than these fish? Than this old way of life? You've gone back to where you were before. Nothing seems to have changed. Do you love me more than this old way of life, Peter? The word that Jesus uses is agape. Do you love, will you serve me? Do you love me with a, with a sacrificial love? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Peter answers with phileo, or you know you're my friend. It's not the question that Jesus asks. Some scholars think this doesn't make any difference, that John is just providing variety in the terms for love. I don't think that's true. I think Peter is sitting there saying, I cannot tell this man, my Savior, that I love him sacrificially when I wasn't willing to risk my life in front of a maid in the courtyard of Caiaphas. I can't make that statement yet. Jesus asked him again, Simon, do you love me? And Jesus uses agape. And Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. And Peter uses phileo. Finally, Jesus asks him, Simon, do you love me? And he uses phileo, are you my friend? And Peter says, well, again, phileo, yes, I'm your friend. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you girded yourself, walked where you would, but when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish to go. This he said to show by what death he was to glorify God. In other words, you're going to be taken captive somewhere, Peter. And then he says to him in verse 19 of chapter 21, follow me. He'd said that once before. This is restoration for Peter. This is forgiveness for Peter. This is, is a recalling of Peter to the life that Christ had called him to in the first place. I don't know how much Peter gets it because the next line he turns and sees John standing there and he says, well, what about this guy? In other words, if I'm going to be bound up and if I'm going to be captive and, and this is going to be miserable for me, what about him? What about John? And Jesus said to him, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what's that to you? Follow me. And he calls him again. Focus, Peter. Focus. Focus on follow me. Doesn't make any difference what's going to happen with John. Doesn't make any difference in this call to you. You follow me. I've put you back on track. I've called you to be mine. Follow me. A tradition grew up that John wouldn't die, that Jesus would come back before John died based on that saying. But John himself, in writing the gospel, says, uh, he didn't say that, that I would live forever. He said, what is it to you, Peter, if I do live forever? That's how John's gospel closes. Well, it closes with a little bit of a postscript after that. Verse 25, there are so many other things which Jesus did, were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. John has focused us on a Savior, a Savior who laid down his life for his people, a Savior who loves his people, and a Savior who, in the, in the end of the book, takes a man who said, I don't know the man, a man who denied his own Lord and Savior, and restores him as a disciple. Follow me. He does that for you and me too. We turn our back on him, we walk away from him, he pulls us back, and because of his suffering, death, and resurrection, he paid the price for even our rebellion. He calls us back to himself and says, follow me.